Hey, Mr. P here. In this video, we're going to talk about movement, um, and specifically at the organismal level, kind of what it is, what are the structures that allows an organism to move, but we're really going to kind of view movement through an introductory lens or an overview lens. We're not, in this particular video, going to talk about the intricacies of individual muscle fiber contraction. That will come in a later video. Um, this is just designed to give you kind of an overview or a foundation that we can build upon in future videos. So let's dive in. When we think about movement, we obviously have to think about skeleton because the skeleton, whether you're an endoskeletal organism or, a, or an organism that has an endoskeleton or an organism that has an exoskeleton, the skeleton is kind of the foundation for which movement um, originates. And so we have to, we have to start there. <clears throat> The skeleton of an animal provides the support and the attachment points for the muscles, okay? So we call muscles skeletal muscle because they are all attached in some way or some capacity to the skeleton. Whether it's an endoskeleton or an exoskeleton, the skeletal muscle is attached to the anchoring points that are bones. You have to attach muscles to bones in order for the muscles to actually contract and move the body. Internal bones comprise an endoskeleton, so when you hear the term endoskeleton, that is a skeleton that is inside the body, okay, those would be internal bones, which is the skeletal form of vertebrates, which are organisms that have a backbone, and obviously humans have a backbone, so we are part of the uh, category of organisms called vertebrates. Then you have insects and other organisms that lack an endoskeleton. They actually have an exoskeleton, which is a skeleton that is on the outside of the body. So all of their attachment points and all of their um, internal muscular systems are going to be inside or on the inside of their bones. Insect exoskeletons are made of a material called chitin. Okay, That is a, a structural polysaccharide found in um, certain organisms like insects. It is similar to cellulose. It's also similar to glycogen, but it has a structural role, okay, like cellulose does. Um, this would like I like to think that it's the equivalent of cellulose um, in organisms, right? So organisms have a cellulose-like material called chitin. Plants obviously are plants, and so they don't have chitin; they have cellulose. But chitin and cellulose both ha both have the same structural um, functions and that would be for structural support. They also provide in insects attachment points for their uh, muscles. Okay, The attachment points for muscles are found on the outside of the bones of an endoskeleton and on the inside of the bones in an exoskeleton. So, um, really simple. If you have bones on the inside of your body, you're an endoskeletal organism, and you therefore have muscles on the outside of those muscles. If you have an exoskeleton, your skeleton is on the far outside of your body, and so you have to have muscles and attachment points for those muscles on the inside of your bones. So let's talk about a little bit of a little case study or a little kind of a, a example of the extraordinary feats that exoskeleton can provide organisms that have those exoskeletons. And so I'm going to talk about two individual organisms and kind of the uh, adaptations in the evolutionary history of these particular organisms. First are these guys. These are Asian weaver ants. Okay, um, They have an extraordinary ability to uh, increase strength. Basically, they are much stronger than any other organism on the planet. They are actually capable of lifting over 100 times their own body mass. Now, I know that they are incredibly small, and sometimes when they are lifting a leaf or a section of a leaf, it doesn't seem like they're that strong because obviously we can lift leaves and little twigs and stuff without any strain. But if you really look at the equivalency factor, if you take a 150 pound man and you give them the same ability to lift 100 times their own body mass, that means that that man could lift 15,000 pounds, which is equivalent to 7.5 tons. What is that equivalent to? That is equivalent to the weight of a full-grown male African elephant, which when you look at in comparison to a human is absolutely asinine, right? Nobody on the history of mankind or on the planet can lift anything remotely close to an elephant, right? But these ants do it on a daily basis. That is absolutely amazing. And it's their exoskeleton and the way that their muscles have attached themselves on the inside gives them an incredible like mechanical advantage 
that allows them to lift a lot of weight, okay? The other one is the flea, okay? And it is a cat flea. These have not an ability to lift, but they have the ability to jump over 150 times their own body length. Now, if you put that in comparison to a six foot man, if a six foot man or woman could lift uh, or could jump 150 times their own body weight or their own body length, they would be able to jump over 900 feet, which is approximately three football fields end to end. Um, it would be absolutely impossible for one person to jump the length of one football field, let alone three. Okay, and uh, obviously football fields look like this. One of the, the one of the most beautiful football fields on the planet, right? Um, might be biased, but it is what it is. So two kind of specific examples of um, two different organisms that have two completely different evolutionary needs. The cat flea needs to be able to jump from organism to organism or from environment to organism. And so um, an advantage that allows them to jump as far as possible um, obviously allows them to secure um, a host. And then you have the, the weaver ants, which are, which are designed to lift and can do so very well. So when we think about endo and exoskeleton segments, there is a lot of similarity and a lot of lateralness, okay, or, or um, kind of lateral comparisons that you can make between endoskeletons and exoskeletons. And so there are enough similarities that many of the same anatomical names have been given to different parts of uh, organisms that are exoskeleton or organisms that have an endoskeleton. And so you can see that when we look at the leg of an insect and the leg of a human, both have a femur. Femur is the upper leg bone. They both have a tibia, which is one of the lower leg bones. They both have tarsus, which is the many bones that make up the majority of the foot. Now, the, the metatarsals and the phalanges would obviously make up the toes, but the bulk of the foot in both case, uh, kind of the bigger bones of the foot would be the tarsus. And so you can see that when you look kind of and compare two different structures, both the, the leg of an in, endoskeletal uh, organism and the leg of an exoskeletal organism, there are some similarities between the two. So how do these particular structures of the leg or of the body in both endo and exoskeleton provide movement. Now let's focus on, because this is kind of human movement, um, or if we think about the topic 11.2, this is on kind of uh, movement within a human lens. And so we're gonna focus on endoskeleton in this particular slide, but you know that you have joints. Now, if we go kind of internal to our body, we have a lot of joints, uh, uh, the joints, which can be seen here, okay, this is a kind of a ball and socket joint, you have the ability to pivot for movement. Joints allow your bones to move. You have joints in the hips, you have joints in the knees, you have joints in the ankles, you have joints in the shoulders and the elbows and the wrist and joints in the neck. These joints allow the bones to move, okay? Now, do joints provide strength? No, joints allow for movement. Bones act as levers and structural support that all of the muscles will attach to. The muscles are going to contract, which adds strength to movements, but joints are going to pivot in order to allow the bones to move. Bones have two roles. They act as levers, so they allow the bones to anchor themselves as a structural support mechanism. They also allow the, the, the muscles to move uh, with a lot of strength. Okay, nerves, those are going to be the uh, cell that coordinates and stimulates muscle contractions. Nerves are going to basically travel all over the body. They're going to most of the time originate in the brain, and they're going to terminate at the individual skeletal muscles, and they're going to allow signals to be sent from the brain to the muscles, and every muscle in the body, which you have hundreds of, are going to be connected in some capacity to the, to the brain through nerves. Muscle, those apply effort or force that allows um, them to anchor. So first of all, muscles are anchored to bones. Um, muscles are also connected via nerves to the brain. And so the nerves are going to send signals or impulses down the nerve um, and they're going to terminate in the muscles and those muscles are going to contract, which are going to apply force to the levers in order to move the bones. And if you move the bones, you're going to move the organism. 
tendons provide attachment points from muscle to bone. So tendons are going to anchor muscles to bones and ligaments are going to anchor bone to bone. So I know that kind of tendons and ligaments maybe in common language are used interchangeably, but they actually have two distinct roles. Tendons are going to anchor muscle to bone and ligaments are going to um, anchor bone to bone. Okay. <clears throat> so how do muscles work? Um, an muscles work in antagonistic pairs. Okay. So antagonistic is a term you need to know. It basically means that they work opposite of each other. So you have muscles that are designed to contract and shorten a particular body part, meaning if we wanted to bring the forearm up, we would need to contract the bicep. If we wanted to extend the forearm to be straight, we need to contract the tricep. The bicep and tricep are antagonistic pairs, meaning they work opposite of each other. Okay, When one contracts, the other relaxes. When one contracts or the opposite contracts, the other one relaxes. Okay, The legs are the same way. When you want to um, bend your leg, um, the hamstring is going to contract and the quad is going to relax. And if you want to straighten the leg, the quad is going to uh, contract and the hamstring has to relax. So those are anti antagonistic pairs as well. Muscles contract by shortening the muscle fibers. There will be a video that is kind of all-inclusive of muscle fiber contraction. Um, that's when we're going to get into the actual in-depth intricacies of the particular um, the muscle contraction. So more to come on that. That would be a single movement on the uh, on the end of muscle is attached to the bone that is not designed to move. That is an anchor. Okay, the anchor for the bicep would be the scapula or kind of up here in the shoulder next to the collarbone. This obviously is not designed to move, so that would be the anchor or the anchor point for those particular muscles. Then there would be another end of the muscle which is attached to a bone that is designed to move and in this case it would be the forearm bones okay the lower arm bones and so this muscle would be able to contract which design is designed to pull these lower arm bones up those are the ones that are designed to move by anchoring to a bone that is not designed to move and so when this muscle actually shortens it has nowhere to go but to pull this lever up, um, which, which contracts the arm and bends the arm. Okay. On the other hand, this muscle is going to contract and shorten, which is going to cause this forearm to then kind of stretch back out and extend and straighten. Okay. Muscles work in pairs so that the opposite movement of the bone can also occur. That is the definition of antagonistic pair. You have to have muscles in antagonistic pairs or you're physically not going to be able to use a body part very effectively okay if we only had a bicep and no tricep we would be able to like contract the arm and bend the arm very well but we wouldn't be able to straighten the arm at all okay we have to be able to bend the arm and straighten the arm or bend the leg and straighten the leg in order to effectively move the organism okay that is the foundation or that is the the introduction that i'm going to leave you with okay this is a really short video more to come uh, in future videos we're going to get into the actual kind of in-depth discussion about the particular joint specifically the knee and the elbow um, all of the anatomical structures that allows our joints to to move effectively and to reduce uh, friction and then in a, in a third video, we're going to get into the actual striated muscle cell and talk about what are the adaptations that those muscle cells have in order to uh, not only contract, but to contract effectively. See ya.